everybody, Jumbo Thick here with my first lore video for uh, Warhammer, specifically for Total War Warhammer. That's what this is going to be geared toward, towards people that are interested in Warhammer, but not necessarily grew up with the tabletop, such as myself. And with that being said, I am by no means a lore master, and I don't know everything. I'm just compiling what I've learned over looking at various army books and um, lots of wiki sources and reading the um, Warhammer fantasy novels. So that's what I'll be basing all of my information on. And with that out of the way, let's get into Norska lore. We are going to start off at the beginning. And to do that, we first need to address the elephant in the room. That is the Warriors of Chaos in that the Norskans share a lot of the same heroes and at one point in time they were actually part of the same army book as the Warriors of Chaos and so there's a lot of crisscrossing and a lot of bleeding into a one another but the Norse and Chaos though they are very closely tied to one another so much so that like I said it's difficult to keep them apart the Norse are their own people there are many different theories amongst the scholars of the Old World regarding the origins of the Norskins. Some say that the Norse are the descendants of demons, a race of bloodthirsty monsters whose very existence is at odds with the natural order, while others argue that they are a race of giants and kin to the hulking denizens of the Ogre Kingdoms. Yet others submit that the Norsemen are supernatural creatures of ice and snow, born of the merciless winds of winter. So, as you can see from that passage, there are many misconceptions and mysteries associated with the Norskins in general. Some of which have a lot to do with their appearance, as like the uh, gristled barbarians, which we will delve into later on in this video. And others involve their choice of religion and the quote-unquote gifts that are bestowed upon them by their deities that seem to make them far superior to average humans uh, strength and speed-wise that are found anywhere in the Empire or in almost any realm of mankind for that matter. In truth, the ethogenesis of the Norskins begins with their ancient ancestors, the Norsi or Norsi, an ancient tribe of barbarians who had long venerated the Chaos Gods, particularly the blood, blood god Karnath. Ancient sagas record that during the cataclysmic events of the Fall of the Old Ones, when chaos first burst forth into the world, that tribes of primitive humans made common causes with the demon hordes, creating unholy pacts with chaos dark lords and binding their people to their worship. Thus were born the first of the warriors of chaos, and the Norsi were among these first tribes to pledge their souls to chaos, alongside the ancestors of the Kurgans and Hung. Riding as the vanguard to the Chaos Hordes, these barbarous mortal tribes brought ruin and devastation upon the gleaming kingdoms of Dwarf and Elf, and so were the mighty bastions of order humbled by their brutal onslaught, and untold millions were slain. And before we go any further, that's kind of where they come from. They're the, the Norse or Norsi people. Um, they were originally not as close to the Chaos Wastes as they are now. They were actually forced there by Sigmar Heldenhammer when he um, united the Empire. He pushed them out of his lands and actually ended up um, raiding their lands often to kind of keep them from building their forces up and coming back to strike back at the Empire. So um, that's their, mostly their origins. Now we're going to move on to the geography of Norska. Geographically, Norska is, for the most part, a frozen boreal wasteland, bereft of all trappings of civilization, albeit one so large that it could fit the entirety of the Empire into it several times over. Stalked by all manner of gruesome monsters, the tales old Wolders tell of it fail to fully encapsulate its brutality. Few crops grow here, for the land is hard as iron and the howling winds cut like daggers of purest cold and it is for this scarcity that the Northmen have learned to spurn the sickle and plow, instead deigning to take what they need to survive from the lands of weaker men with the axe and sword. 
The network of fjords and mist-clouded isles wreaths the coast, and it is from here that the Northmen build and tether the launch ships with which they terrorize the shores of the known world. And as this passage suggests, the Norskins cannot completely depend on their land to sustain them as a people. It's just, it's too barren for them to actually sustain their population. So they're completely reliant on raiding to sustain themselves. Very reminiscent of the uh, Vikings of the our real world. Scattered coastal sediments provide some respite from the harshness of the elements, but even they are regularly assaulted by blood krakens and other such horrors. Further inland, however, the great fjords give way to frozen steppes where brutal tribesmen hunt their game, taking care to avoid the bone-carpeted layers of ice drakes. It is a grim, shadowy land where the weak do not live long, and where living means a constant fight for survival, supremacy, and the chance to appease the dark gods. The landscape is famed chiefly for its mighty and foreboding mountain ranges, such as the Jotunheims, the mountains of frost and dusk, and the mountains of Tijazi. I can't really pronounce that one completely. So, in addition to these mountains, Norsk is also home to many forests and bizarre chaos warp landscapes. The closer you come to the warp gates, it gets a little strange. Chaos tends to warp everything around it, and time ceases to exist in certain places in the chaos wastes. The seas of Norska are just as dangerous as the land itself, for amidst the frigid waves of the Sea of Chaos prowl the fearsome black lawn ships, crewed by barbarians and mastered by the terrible champions of chaos, who reeve and raid as they will, bringing bloody battle to any ship cursed with the misfortune of crossing them. From the ports and fjords of the Nordlands do the terrible chaos fleets sail, harboring cargoes of bloodthirsty marauders intent on putting civilization to fire and blade. Moreover, the icy cold of the Sea of Claws is itself as much the bane of sailors as the savage sea-faring warriors who ride its waves. With winds so cold they freeze the very spray, causing knives of frost to pierce the flesh and freeze extremities and deep below the tides lie creatures that have been touched with the grace of chaos that capsize ships and feast upon the flesh of men. So you're getting a little glimpse into the Sea of Claws there and how dangerous it is. Um, that is the land, the sea between the Empire and Norska that you can cross um, during the uh, Total War Warhammer games. Massive frozen glaciers are a common sight, particularly in the arctic climes of the northmost parts of the country. The great Helram Glacier is one of the most well known of these, having been the site of a climactic battle between the ironclad chaos warriors of Valgar the Butcher and the undead legions of Setra the Imperishable during the fabled War of Sand and Snow. The great ice field of Dragon Mort too has played host to mighty conflicts between the Bersenling tribe and their rivals, particularly the tribes of the Kurgan. So we get the Tomb Kings mentioned way up here, um, just shows you how far reaching and interconnected the Warhammer world is. And the Kurgan and the Hunt, which we kind of spoke of earlier. And just to give you a quick little blurb on them, the Kurgan and Hun are a horde, um, mostly of mostly horsemen and barbarian kind of savages, um, kind of known to be cannibals, may or may not be true. And they're mostly inspired by like the Huns of our actual world. And further past them are the Chaos Dwarves, which we will um, get into later. But as the past has suggested, there's often war between all of these different tribes. Um, the Norskins are constantly fighting amongst each other as much as they are raiding the other lands. But they will come together when the gods will them to, to go raiding south along with the great chaos hordes. Usually it takes a great champion to rally everyone together, but they will put aside their differences for the glory of the great chaos gods. So not exactly... Um, geography in and of itself, but kind of like markers are these monoliths that um, 
are almost like common landmarks found throughout Norska. And they act as both sites of worship and actual waypoints, like um, for traveling. And the most striking features of Norska, raised by mortal and immortal hands alike, are the great monoliths that dot the primeval wilderness. These ungodly monuments serve as focal points for channeling the raw power of chaos. And sorcerers who find themselves near these constructs will likely find their powers greatly augmented by their proximity. Those with the courage to look upon the monoliths more closely are likely to find runic inscriptions in the Norskan tongue writ clearly upon them. These inscriptions often foretell the sagas of the great heroes of Norska, the champions of chaos. Chaos monoliths, as they are known, are towering runestones raised by the Norse tribes for the commemoration of some legendary tribal hero or king, for some deed of martial majesty that won the figure the renown of the dark gods. Monoliths are most often raised with stone, but can also be composed of more esoteric materials as a result of the Norskans' otherworldly qualities. Bone, bloody flesh, marble, precious gems, and so on are all examples of materials chaos monoliths may be composed of. Wealthier tribes are able to commission monoliths to be crafted by the chaos dwarves of Zorn Uskal, who are said to cast the great rune stones in brass, polished to a mirror sheen that reflects not the countenance of the onlooker, but the savage visage of the warlord the monolith commemorates. So, once again, you're hearing about these chaos doors I just managed from the Darklands. You can see that they are trading in some way with the uh, with the Norskins, and you can see how important these monuments are. And I believe they're even going to be important in the Total War Warhammer video game when they finally release it. They mentioned erecting monuments to the Dark Gods, though not exactly tied to the um, heroes like they should be, but that's okay. Monoliths serve as commemorators of heroes and kings, repositories of the histories of the Norskin people, but they also serve as markers of tribal territories or the holdings of warbands. Monoliths quickly become places of pilgrimage amongst the northern tribes, and most Norskins will not pass one without leaving an offering of some kind, or at least reciting the saga written upon it. The Norsemen believe that the gods themselves watch over the monoliths, protecting it from the ravages of time and judging the worth of those who came before them. Monoliths may sometimes stand watchful over cairns of fallen champions, where the bodies of the dead heroes are interred often with their weapons and armors, making them a tempting, albeit difficult target for would-be grave robbers. So, even amongst the Norskins, you can see that they're almost terrified to go grave robbing, even though they know that there's powerful weapons and armors in these tombs under these, um, under these monuments, but they're unwilling to take the risk because they fear their gods so resolutely. Now we will move on to the Norskins as a actual people. So the Norskins are a distinctive race forged of the hardiest of mortal stock and possessed of tall, broad frames and extremely muscular builds. The songs and legends of the world describe them as nigh unstoppable, and those who have borne witness to the fury of berserking Norsemen will carry the sight unto their graves. Towering height and thick of bone and steely muscle, the strength of the Norskins is rightly regarded as legendary. The Norskins tend to keep long hair and almost universally cultivate large, wild beards, as they regard shaving as an effeminate practice. Norsemen tend to have pale, weather-beaten skin and red or blonde hair, though darker hair colors such as black and brown are not rare amongst them. So that's just a brief description of what the Norskins physically look like, but you can see that um, they're actually a very large people. In fact, from what I understand, they are significantly larger than like an average Empire State Troop. Um, in the book uh, Wolfric the Wanderer, they come across, he describes um, towering like a foot or two over a regular empire statesman so it just goes to show you how much larger they are than a uh, than an average person the norskins are a warrior race of the highest caliber and so it is unsurprising that warriors form 
the vast majority of the Norskin tribes. While all Norskins are skilled to at least some extent in Warcraft, becoming a true warrior in Norska is a far more complicated affair than in other lands. Anyone can take up a blade and fight, but to be able to truly call oneself a warrior, a free man must undertake special rites of passage. Different tribes have different rites. Some require three tests. The test of strength, the test of skill, and the test of courage. Others may send out candidates armed only with a spear in order to slay dreaded beasts, such as trolls, chaos spawn, demons, or emir. Some clans erect a fake village and populate it with thralls armed with shields and clubs. The aspiring warriors must then raid the village, slaying all within in order to recover a prize such as gold, meat, ale, or a buxom female thrall. Now, as you can see there, um, it just goes to show this is more of a, a insight into them as a people, as to kind of like their culture. They're very warlike, but you have to earn your right to be called a warrior, which is shows that there's actually a lot of prestige in their society as well. And you can see that they are actually practicing. They're actually training themselves to fight. They're not just simply relying on their, their pure skill to carry the day. So they actually are a, um, a more disciplined army than you would think. Um, so now we're going to get into some of the ways that the Norskins protect themselves in battle and simply just surviving in their harsh native climate. So Norskin warriors are known to festoon talismans and other arcane items upon their person. These include the fanes of mighty beasts, the heads of powerful enemies, and runic talismans that are thought to invoke the power of the dark gods. Norskins also bear various tattoos and ritualistic scarifications that openly display their fanatical dedication to the northern gods. A superstitious and fiercely pious folk, the Northmen believe in all manner of portents, signs, and omens. Every Norskin, from highest champion to simplest marauder, will carry a trinket or two to ward off the evil eye and bring about the favor of the gods. So, from that passage, we can kind of take that uh, they're very, as, you, as they said, very pious, very devout in their worship, but they're also, also fearful, and so they're taking measures to protect themselves ahead of time. Um, because if you're li living in the realm of chaos, you're under constant threat. And so in that chaos wastelands, you could be attacked by a savage troll or any manners of beasts. The taint of chaos is ever increasing and has ever been strongest in the north due to its proximity to the gateway to the realms of chaos that lies at the northernmost point of the world. For this reason, the hard warriors of Norska have ever worshipped the dark gods of chaos. Even if the names of these gods have been twisted and reflected through the lenses of the countless clans of the Norse, while all tribes recognize the chaos gods as their masters, they may pray and shout and perceive them by different names than those that the scholars and sorcerers know them. Ultimately, however, it is always the ruinous powers who are listening and responding to their cries. Thus, raids from the north seek not only to take gold, women, and food for the sake of survival, but also to shed blood for the gods. Whenever the fur-cloaked warriors of Norska emerge from their dreaded longships, their objective may not be to simply pillage, but to kill, maim, and destroy in the myriad names of the chaos gods. And it just goes to show you that um, they don't always know the gods as Korn, Nurgle, Zin, Slanesh. They have many different names. Like, for instance, Korn is sometimes called the, uh, the Hound, and Slanesh the Serpent, and it goes on from there. Um, matter of fact, this would actually be a good time to segue into the religion of the Norskins as a whole. Norskin religion is based primarily around the worship of the Chaos Gods, which are venerated by various local aspects and names both similar to and distinct to those they are known by to the scholars and priests of the Empire. Commonly, the Norskins, like the other human races who dwell around the Chaos Wastes, venerate all the Chaos Gods in a single pantheon. As a purely practical consideration in order to draw upon all of the gifts and powers of the four gods in order to better survive in the harsh north. In spite of this, there are many tribes that do, in fact, take a single Chaos God to be their patron, 
who is then seen as both the father and protector of that tribe. Commonly, that god is also the patron of the chieftain. In the vast majority of Norse tribes, Corn takes up this position, as he is by far the most popular choice of patron deity in the battle-torn North. In addition to the chaos gods themselves, the Northmen religion also incorporates various demon princes, fallen chaos champions, revered ancestors, and various other lesser spirits into its traditions. Despite the presence of these additional deities, however, it is always the chaos gods alone which are ever-present and who receive the highest degree of veneration, being the core set of deities Norse religion revolves around. So these, these passages give you a insight into um, how the Norskins worship their deities, and now we're going to actually touch on them individually as, a, um, as deities. So we are going to start with corn, as befitting such a warlike society. So in battle, the Norse look to corn, the war god, for strength. The blood god is renowned in Norse sagas as the embodiment of strength and a granter of victory. And so thousands upon thousands of Norse warriors are dedicated to a savage creed of wanton bloodshed. Amongst the Norse, the most common name for the blood god is Karnath meaning Lord of Rage, and the Dark Tongue of Chaos. But other names are also prevalent amongst the tribes, such as Akar, Korn, the Brass Lord of Battle. The Hound, as I mentioned earlier, was a, uh, another name that I've heard given to Korn. The Seers and Vitki take Zinch, the Raven God, as their patron, and beseech the Changer of Ways to aid them in their witchery, and to one day grant them preeminence over the warrior kings who lead the tribes. As most Norskan spellcasters and cow sorcerers of a sort, channeling the black wind of Dar to power their profane divination, it is common for them to take, uh, take at least one more of the dark gods as their patrons, and most commonly this patron is Zinch, due to his association with magic and sorcery. For the most part, however, Zinch is distrusted by most Norskans, particularly warriors, for his cunning ways. Yet, as he is also seen as the god of wind and, and the tide, most Norskans will strive for his favor before taking to the Laurel ships in order to ensure a safe voyage. And you can see kind of a dichotomy there in the aspect of Zinch, meaning being that the sorcerers are obviously wanting to worship him because he's a god of magic and change, but the Warriors are hesitant. They, they don't like his trickery, but at the same time, they need him to guide them to their final destination. In times of plague and famine, the Norse offer sacrifices to Nurgle, placate the crow god, and to persuade him to withhold his blessings. Some tribes dedicate themselves to the plague father in such occasions. However, believing that only through fighting in his name shall they be delivered from the ruinous touch of Nurgle's contagions. In the um, Malice Darkblade novels, there is a clan of uh, Nurgle-worshipping Norse, actually called the Skin Riders, and they are disgusting, like putrefied beings, sailing rotten ships that the Dark Elves often come to blows with in the sea, fighting over choice slaves or thralls, as the uh, Norse call them. So then we move on to Slanesh, the Great Serpent, is prayed to in the aftermath of battle for fulsome feasting and celebration. He is also prayed to for fertility and virility, as in, is invoked in some tribes' marriage ceremonies. Um, the actual heart, like your physical heart, is associated with Slanesh, as can be seen in the novel Wolfric the Wanderer, where he has to, whenever he um, fights and kills a offering for Slanesh, he has to take out your beating heart and offer it up to the god to appease him. And with the gods out of the way, we're going to get into the Norse funerary practices um, and just how death affects the Northmen in general. So the Norsemen have an acute obsession with death, equally that of their enemies as much as their own. Theirs is a culture that exalts and embraces that which is brutal and deadly values the masculine and strong and which teaches men to be reckless with death. This affords them a clear psychological advantage over their enemies. For where the men of the south and east might fear the pain of their death, 
the Norskins embrace it as the only road to the true realm beyond the walking dream of flesh. Amongst the Norsemen, it is un an unthinkable fate for a man to die without holding his weapon. For how can the gods permit him to enter their halls when he cannot prove he met his end in battle? A far worse affront is for a warrior's corpse to be dismembered of his hands. For how is he to grip his sword and shield in the eternal battlefields of the dark gods without a hand to clasp around the handle of his blades? Indeed, to desecrate, desecrate a corpse in such a way is a grave crime amongst the Norse, sure to drive them to seek vengeance for the perpetrator, no matter the cost. So the Norse believe that the state of your body in its final moments, when you finally die, that that dictates what you're going to be like in the afterlife. So, for instance, if you lost your arm before you died, you wouldn't have that arm in the afterlife. Therefore, it's almost Egyptian in that, like, you're going to be taking with you whatever you have on you into the afterlife. And so you, you're having to prove yourself that you died a glorious death and you didn't drown in the sea because that's actually a terrible way to go. As a matter of fact, they have a god named Myrmidon that is the um, sea god and he revels in bringing people down to the depths and he actually keeps their souls in his own terrible realm so that they can't enter the halls of their ancestors. And now we're going to get into some of the actual funerary practices. So, the Norse possess many complex rituals to honor those who find their way to tread the paths of the realms of chaos. By far the most well known is to place a dead warrior upon a lawn ship and burn it to the sea. This is a prestigious thing and is reserved only for chieftains and mighty champions. By placing a warrior upon a ship, it is believed that his soul shall rise with the flames to be sent on his way to the dark gods. Among the Norsemen, it is considered a tiding of great doom to wage war while a warrior is committed to the gods in this way, for to fight in the shadow of unquiet souls is an omen of ill fortune. It is often customary to recite the dark and brutal deeds of the fallen, that the gods might know who it is that comes to their hall. Another similar funerary practice, one reserved for warriors who fall in battle, is to place them upon a burning pyre. The fires are believed to carry the spirit of the dead warrior high to the halls of the dark gods, where they shall tell their tales to their honored fathers and share their stories of victory and war with the other great warriors and kings of ancient days. All around their pyres, their shield brothers gather to give a great shout into the sky, bringing their axes and swords uh, to hammer against their shields while they roar and bellow the names and bloody feats of valor of those who have fallen, that the gods of the north might know who they take into their lofty tables. So now that we have passed the funerary practices of the Nor Norsemen on, let's get into the way their society is actually structured from the top down. So the Norskins as a single cohesive people do not exist. Indeed, the very term Norskin is an imperial labeling. They are instead divided into various numerous tribal confederations. They're as much at war with each other as they are with the Kurgan and Hun tribes to the east of, or the empire to the south. These various Norse tribes are often nations unto themselves, possessing varying pantheons of gods, traditions, heroes, and tribal dialects. The southern tribes are somewhat milder than the northern counterparts. While they raid and plunder just as much as the rest of their kin, it is from the tribes that the ideals of trade and cooperation have begun to take root, all but shakily. When not waging war against the southern realms, these tribes often trade exotic furs, metals, and their services as mercenaries to employers in cities such as Marienburg. So that just goes to show you that even though they are savage barbarians in the eyes of most people, the... Marienburg has seen them seen this as an opportunity to use them as shock troops and cannon fodder essentially but um, they make excellent mercenaries and they're willing to work for gold however all Norse are united by the shared ancestry and a mutual veneration of the four dark lords of chaos and as such when the gods speak and command war to be made against the empire southern tribes take up the call as readily as their more northernly kinsmen to refuse the call of the gods is the greatest dishonor a tribe can bring unto itself, and is often seen by other Norskins as grounds for annihilation. 
And so, here's a few of the great tribes. They are the Aislings, Graylings, Vargs, Sarls, Bjornlings, Scalings, Bersonlings, Hastlings, and Kiveligs. I can't really, I can't pronounce the last one. But um, in addition to these main tribes, there are some lesser known tribes and outposts outside of Norska. Um, the most famous one is probably Skegi, which is a Norskan outpost in Lustria that was founded by Lost Ericsson, is actually going to be featured in the new Warhammer 2 when it arrives. The Norse tribes are ruled by a king who distributes hunting grounds and territory to his lords, who are known as Jarls. The Jarls in turn bestow gifts and favor upon their sworn warriors, who are known as bondsmen. Warriors occupy the most vaunted and esteemed place in Norse society, due to the warlike men of the northern tribes and their insatiable lust for blood. The rest of Norskan society consists of the elderly, the infirm, and the women. At the very bottom rung of Norskan society are the thralls, which are slaves taken in raids for use as menial labor, consorts, and worse, as sacrifices to appease the dark hunger of the gods. And so the holy men of the Norse society are the seers, or vitki. We kind of touched on them earlier, sorcerers, basically. As they refer to in Norskin, admittedly, many of these shamanistic spellcasters are chaos sorcerers who draw upon the power of the dark gods to fuel their divination. These priests are often the advisors of the mighty Norse chieftains and wield great authority over the tribes due to their status as the mouthpiece of the gods. But with a word can a Vitki order the death of any man, and thralls die brutally by the score in order to seal the demonic packs and empower foul rituals by which they draw upon their dark powers of chaos. Steeped in arcane tradition of the ruinous powers, it falls to these privileged men and women to interpret the movements of the winds of chaos, the whispers of demons, and the spirits of fallen warriors in order to guide the Jarl to choose the proper path for the tribes, one of blood, glory, and conquest. And so it's kind of interesting there that the Vidki can be both men and women, um, which is interesting because in Norse society you don't often, it's not... It's not illegal for a woman to be a warrior, but um, it is almost frowned upon, like because they are physically less capable, usually. There are instances, like for instance, Valkia the Bloody, who is a demon prince now, princess, excuse me, that um, was once a Norskin. The Skalds are keepers of northern lore and chroniclers of the histories of the Norsemen. Part entertainer, part warrior, these individuals are held in high esteem by Norse Jarls and kings for their wisdom and knowledge. These men recount the sagas and the deeds of the ancestors and the dark gods themselves, often also composing new sagas out of the feats and exploits of contemporary heroes to add to the collective history of the Norskins. As they are skilled and powerful warriors also, many Norse war leaders find it prudent to have a scald in their cohort. When the call to war is sounded, these men have the honor of bearing their leader's own standard into battle. And Vitki are essentially the clergy of the um, Norskins, and the Skalds are the historians. But, you know, not book historians, more of a uh, historian that will cleave you in half and then talk about it later. So that actually brings me to crime and punishment in Norse society, which you would assume from everything you're hearing about this warlike society that they wouldn't have any kind of like crime and punishment system in place but it they have something it's just not as complicated as many of the more civilized um, societies they've developed this thing called wear guild which i think i'm pronouncing that properly but it is basically their law of crime and punishment it would be easy to decry the Morsemen as being lawless savages, with no care for the destruction and carnage they leave in their wake. Truly, they are a savage people who have little interest in other races beyond slaughtering or enslaving them, and who openly worship the Dark Lords of Chaos. However, Norse culture is far more than simply a series of endless battles, and to decry Norse society as being lawless is simply false, favoring simple laws over the complex ones preferred in the Empire and elsewhere. 
the Ware Guild, Mangold, and the Ton of the Northmen, is one of the few universally accepted traditions of Norska. To put it simply, any crime, no matter how great or small, incurs a debt, or Ware Guild. When a man is wronged in Norseman society, he may seek recompense from a Jarl, Chaos Champion, or leader of Norska society. The man states his case, and the accused is given a chance to defend himself. Witnesses of honorable character are then produced by both sides to lend their perspectives on things. And once all the evidence is presented, the Jarl comes to his decision. Such a verdict rarely comes easily, and is never entirely fair. Depending on the quality of the arguments and the Jarl's own mood, in any event, the final arbitration of the matter rests with the Jarl, who sets the ultimate price of Weregild. This can be in the form of a fine, which varies according to the importance of the individual murdered, Northmen kings and jarls thus require the highest level of recompense because their warriors are thought of as superior to the southern clans. And over the centuries, the Ware Guild has expanded to cover all manners of possible offenses. Thus, in instances where no one has been killed, a jarl must be somewhat creative in his arbitration. So this just goes to show you that they're all laws in the north. And they all, it's kind of that unspoken eye for an eye you killed my dad, so now I have I get to kill your granddad or you know, something like that. And that's often how it happens is if there isn't somebody to punish directly, they'll start to punishing your descendants. And then if you're a high-ranking member of society, they'll punish your clan. And, and it just goes on from there. But it's more, for the most part, it's an eye for an eye. Moving on to something a little more light. Um, birth and how the Norsemen think of it uh, as a society. So amongst many Norsken tribes, it is believed that a birth cannot occur without a death. The arrival of a newborn is thus said to signify doom for the tribe, and so, to appease the hungry spirits, the Norsemen would butcher a thrall to take the place of the newborn. And other tribes, however, see birth as the truest signs of their god's favor and will. There is a, tr a tradition amongst some tribes where the father would feast upon the flesh of the afterbirth. For it is believed that the mis this material holds within it the essence of change, and thus by devouring it, one can draw strength and power from it. And it's just, you know, some of those practices are actually practiced today in modern society, but um, you can see their superstitions at work here, even in their uh, birthing process. And now on to mourning. There are two ideal fates for a warrior in Norska society, gaining the marks of the dark gods and death. As a result of this, women are forbidden to mourn their sons and husbands. Instead, they are to celebrate their passing with feasting and praise for the departed. It is a common custom for Norskan women to cut off their fingers as an offering to the shadow, shadowy warrior hags, and the daemons might bear their, their men safely to the honored halls of the dark gods. And so that's just a quick little, man, it just shows you how grim society is, but um, they have an interesting view on the afterlife and everything's kind of a party afterwards. It's, it's, uh, it's more about the, the afterlife than it is the actual death or the loss that, that they've taken. And now we're moving on to one of my final topics I have at hand. And I actually should have included this earlier, but um, whaling is extremely important in Norskan society. And a lot of people have been asking, well, man, where are they getting all their food? Surely they can't raid all of their food. And it's true that they there'd be no way for them to sustain their populace on just stolen food. So, whaling is another industry of Norska, given that the sea creatures of the far north are often as twisted by the touch of the dark gods as any other creature. The whalers of Norska are often made of sterner stuff than most, and thus it is that whaling is one of the few professions not directly concerned with battle that is respected even amongst warriors. Whalers provide much to a Norse village's food stores, their meat being able to feed entire villages well. Their skin is used to manufacture rope, and their blubber is used to make oil for fuel. 
The easiest way to hunt them is to use boats to herd schools of small whales ashore where they can be easily killed. But most Norskins spurn such a womanly way, savoring the thrill of setting sails upon a mighty launchship to hunt a monstrous whale throughout the sea of chaos. Above all do Norsemen treasure the blood and fury of any endeavor, and whaling is no exception. When such a beast is sighted, the launch ships sail after it immediately, harpooners gathering at the fore to bring the beast down. The bravest men then leap from their launch ships prow onto the leviathan's back, tearing its hide apart with strikes from their axes. But nonetheless, these beasts, twisted and warped as they are by the powers of chaos, are amongst the most terrifying of creatures within the northern seas. And so it is that they encounter with them must be swiftly and surely settled. For such is their bulk that they can easily capsize any long ship, no matter its size, and can swallow entire crews in their gaping maws. Harpooners must thus ensure a swift kill, and bets are able to impale the beast right into the gargantuan heart, while others of lesser skill instead skewer it in the ribcage, enabling them to instead drag the beast towards the long ship, where the crew can slay it with their axes. Uh, a whaling vessel seldom returns without towing a slaughter whale behind it, as it is considered better amongst whalers to submit to a watery grave than face the dishonor of returning to their villages empty-handed. When a vessel does return with the spoils of victory, any Norse village or town has much to celebrate. Thanks and sacrifice are offered up to the dark gods, and much drinking occurs, lasting well into the week, and the survival of the village is now assured for the next many months. And this just goes to show you that the Norsemen are just, they've adapted well to their climate. And what you wouldn't think that um, whaling would be so important, but it is when that's what you have to live off of. And so the Norsemen have... They have a knack for killing monsters, which I think is going to be pretty evident in the game when it comes out. I think they're going to have a big boost to that because that's what they deal with every day of their life in their homeland. Also of note, just little side notes here um, on Norskin economy. They are a bartering economy. So if you were to come back with whale blubber, you would trade it for bear skins or you know some other commodity that you might need. So that's how their society is. And now they do value um, gold and silver and whatnot, but they don't like have any designated coins or amounts. So everything is haggling. And also, um, just a slight little tangent here, their language. Um, Norskin is a complex and ancient tongue. Structurally, it's similar to Kazalid, which is the language of the dwarfs. But it's also deeply inf influenced by the Dark Tongue and, to a lesser extent, to Old Reichspiel, which kind of shows you their roots when they used to be the Norsi or Norsai, when they were so close to the Empire all that long, long time ago. And with that, that is the end of my Norskin lore video. I want to thank everybody if you've made it this far in the video. This has been more of a, like, societal lore video than a, um, like, direct history of themselves so if you're interested in the battles um, I would highly recommend you to look into going to the um, Warhammer wiki I'll have a link to it in the description um, they have very details on all of the major battles a lot of them are actually technically chaos battles but the Norsemen participated and um, I will not be covering the end times because a lot of people are upset by the end times and I personally don't much care for them. I don't like a lot of the storylines, um, how they ended. Um, but f for instance, like Wolfric the Wanderer had a very big part in the end times. Well, I say big, but Sigvald is actually technically a warrior of chaos slash um, Norskin hero, and he had a very large part to play as well. So there is that. Um, but that's it, guys. That's all I've got today. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe if you like the content. Leave me some comments in the comment section. Let me know if I missed anything. Um, correct me. I know I'm not going to cover everything. I'm just, uh, I'm not that good. <laughs> and thank you for your time. Have a good day.